our journey through prophecy with the classical Mayan prophecy of 2012. Now, as most of us realize, life goes on beyond 2012. But this prophecy actually begins pre-Mayan period. And the Mayans uh, picked it up, developed it, and then from them, the uh, Aztecs and Toltecs maintained it. To understand the so-called Mayan prophecy, you have to understand our starry sky above, because that's where the Mayans got some of their um, metaphor, some of their philosophy related to the, prof the prophecies that they presented. They looked up into the heavens and they saw the Milky Way. And uh, to give you an idea, this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, and we live on the outskirts of the galaxy right here. And our pole star looks out into this direction, so our planet is actually facing that way. But when you look into the galaxy, you actually see the fantastic center of the Milky Way in which our little planet spins on the outskirts. When the ancient people looked at this, they saw the dark rift and this glowing bulge of light, the galactic bulge. And they developed some myths built around these two features of the center of our galaxy. You also need to know that they considered each of us to be stars in the galaxy, in the heavens above. How could that be? Well, they have an old story that I'm going to share with you. Each of these classical Mesoamerican groups had a god that worked with them, a winged serpent god. Uh, Quetzalcoatl in Aztec language, Kuku Khan in the Yucatan Mayan language, and Guku Maz in the mountain uh, Guatemala Mayan language. The winged serpent god comes together with the children of God one day and says, darkness has fallen upon the earth. We must help light the earth. Who among you will be a bright light to the earth? And in the story, the Mayans say, the most beautiful among the children of God comes up and says, well, of course, it ought to be me. I'll do it. And uh, Quetzalcoatl says, okay, so he makes this sacred fire. And he turns to the beautiful godling and says, jump into the fire. As he approaches the sacred fire, it's just too hot, he backs off. Then the ugliest among the children of God comes forward and says, I'll do it, and leaps into the fire. And all the children of God run to the edge of heaven and look down at the earth, and the sun comes up, and they go, wow. What a beautiful light for the earth. Well, immediately, the most beautiful godling runs straight over and jumps into the fire. So all the children of God go to the edge of heaven, look down, and the moon comes up. And they all giggle, not as bright as the sun, but it is a light in heaven. Then the great winged serpent god turns around to each one of them and says, Now each of you must put your hearts into this effort. And so they all put their hearts into the sacred fire, come to the edge of heaven, and all the stars appear. Each one of us is one of those lights in the heavens above. Our spiritual, uh, truly heartfelt self is a celestial being, not a terrestrial one. But eventually we enter into the terrestrial reality, and there is a story that's going to unfold, and that's the prophecy. The um, ancient ones used two little stories about these features. One is that this was the mouth and the body of the celestial crocodile. And that is the lower energy, the dark energy, the self-centered energy. And it's always gnawing at the light forces, the good energy, the base of the tree of life. It's always gnawing at it. And they saw that as the great struggle between the dark and the light. The other little story they tell is about the paddler gods, canoe paddler gods. And they are tr paddling their canoe and trying to avoid the flow of the current into darkness and get through that 
and enter into the great light area of the cosmos. So that story it also tells them a little bit about the struggle. Now when we used to look at ancient uh, Mayan uh, illustrations, they seemed so strange to us. We weren't really sure what they were all about until you looked up into the heavens like they were doing. Um, here you see an illustration uh, uh, John Major Jenkins uh, developed uh, some of this stuff. You see the great Milky Way, and there's the mouth of the great crocodile, the dark rift. Here you see the crocodile with his head down, right here. Here you see this wonderful plumed bird up here, the Quetzal bird, but in the perfect shape of the Big Dipper. And in the Little Dipper is our pole star, this little bowl here. And you see that their imagery had something to do with looking up into the heavens and seeing the layout of the heavens. They also noticed that the Milky Way would rise and it would set. So it had this movement through the heavens. They watched the movement of the Milky Way. In watching it, they determined the passage of time, the cycles of celestial movement, and that tied in perfectly with their ability to not only give you the prophecy, but the measurement of when the prophecy would occur. Here's a depiction, again, of the paddler gods trying to make it through heaven and avoid the dark rift, paddling their... Uh, uh, spiritual boat toward the light and the flow of the Milky Way rising and descending. Another feature they noticed is that the path of our star, our sun, runs right through the center of the Milky Way galaxy, right between the dark rift and the galactic bulge. They measured that and they found that on the winter solstice, December 21st, 22nd, of 2012, the sun would be right in the middle of that profound feature of the heavens above and of the center of the galaxy. And that, to them, was a major marker in the movement of celestial time. And therefore, their prophecy was, on that date, a major shift will occur. They also noticed that the Milky Way changed as time passed from high in the sky in 6000 BC to right on the horizon with the rising sun on uh, 2012. Here is uh, the Mayan writing of the date August 13th, 3114 BC. That date is the precise beginning of the sun which actually means the age that we have been living in. It began August 13th, 3114 BC. And here is the depiction of the sequence of the 13 Bakhtun moving through to the end, which will occur December 21st, 2012. If we also move to the Aztecs and look at this sun disk we call it, the Aztecs called it, the Eagle Bowl. This sun disk incorporates some of the ages and ideas of the Mayans. Even the Aztecs said that, we got this idea from the Mayans. Here's a little uh, comparison at the museum in Mexico City to show you how large it is compared to a person, it's stone. And now here's a colorized version of it to help show you some of the features. Uh, I want to show you that there are two huge celestial serpents descending around the outer ring, and they come down here with these dragon-esque uh, serpent faces and two human faces coming out of it. You'll notice in the middle these features of these four squares, two circles, and this pyramid right here, two pyramids actually, one inside the other. Here's a close-up of the descending dragon-esque serpents out of the celestial heavens, and it's the sun god and the fire god. What this symbolizes 
is the descent of the kundalini life force, the fire of life, and the sun or the consciousness, the higher celestial consciousness descends out of the heaven into terrestrial life, into matter, and a three-dimensional world limiting its awareness. So consciousness descended to lower levels and life force, energy, descended to lower vibrations. That's what's symbolized by the descent of these two great serpents. Now we're just going to focus on the center of the eagle bowl or the Aztec sun disk. And as you look at it, you'll see the four squares which symbolize four ancient ages. The two circles which uh, have a message to us and we'll go through that in a minute. And then you see this uh, two pyramids in the middle, the red one inside, the striped one, and then a great circle in the middle of this uh, inner feature. And this is the sun god depicted in the great circle there. Now, I have laid this out with the timetables, comparing them with some of the Edgar Casey material and other legends with the ages as the Mayans, Aztecs tell it. The first age is the age of the jaguar. It's this upper square here on the upper right. That is an age of darkness and the um, Aztecs tell us that the children of God, when they descended out of heaven, they became self-centered, self-interested, only seeking self-gratification and self-glorification and exaltation. And they became like wood, they said. The Bible says they became stiff-necked, uh, just interested in their own interest and not paying attention to the harmony of the whole or um, other souls or the ideals that nature was flowing with. This is an ancient period, according to Edgar Casey, this period would be about 12 to 10 million years ago, and it was the age of Mu or Lemuria. As we come to the end of that age, you see this symbol of a claw grabbing a heart and holding the heart. This is the symbol of um, getting control of your runaway emotions and desires, grabbing control of your heart's desires and subduing them to cooperate with the harmony of nature, the celestial forces, and higher purposes, higher ideals. Not such low gratification energy and pursuits. So the symbol here once again is getting a hold of your emotions. You may recall in Hinduism the symbol is a five horses on a chariot and you holding the reins to try to hold back the five senses that you are running away with to gratify them. So you hold them back. Here the claw holds the heart and calms it down, centers the heart. Then comes the second age, the age of water. It's the age of fish-like people. This is um, a way of bringing them into the harmony of all life. The water is a symbol of the soulful life, uh, but Quetzalcoatl notices that one of the problems they're having is they've lost touch with who they really are and their origin. They cannot see the horizon anymore in this vast, infinite oneness, so they don't see where they've come from and where they need to go to. Now they're in a process of growth, of development and they need to see from where they came and to where they need to go. So in this age he creates a firmament just like the Old Testament in the Bible on the across the Atlantic Ocean there the same story is here. Quetzalcoatl creates a firmament in the waters. This gives you a sense of time, of space, of direction. I was there I'm now here and I need to go there. Again, the Edgar Casey readings would associate this uh, age with the Lemurians um, and Mu. This was an ancient time, 12 to 10 million years ago. Um, it comes to an end about 50,000 BC, according to Casey. Uh, so it's a long, long period. 
As it ends, we start to develop the third age, which is the first real age of an individual form for us to use in the earth. It is not yet a body like this body, not as dense, not as uh, three-dimensional. There's still an etheric quality to us. We're like um, light beings uh, manifesting uh, or like Casey said, thought forms, taking tighter form and projecting. Um, that's also associated with the, the word uh, Lemuria. It has a connotation of uh, ghost. Many uh, people believe it's associated with the lemur, that, that little uh, animal in Madagascar. But it also has the connotation of ghost or spirits. And that was more our nature during this period. As we come into the third age, it's the age of the fiery rain or the blue maize people, blue corn people. What happened, the story goes, is um, all the children of God came before Mother God and said, Mom, we're in trouble. We have gotten lost in this world, this uh, three-dimensional reality of materialism and substance, and it has a hold of us and we're getting confused and we can't find our way back to the celestial realms. She says to them, bring me the ashes of all of your mistakes. And she puts them in this uh, huge bowl and then she asks them to put the spittle of the gods in there, that magic water that comes from within them, to put the water of their life, their spittle, into the bowl. She mixes it up and she makes the blue maize people, perfect in every way. Multi-chakras, uh, celestially able to attune to the heavens while also being physically incarnate in the earth. It's an ideal form for them. And it's not as solid as this yet, so don't think it's like a physical body yet. Well, this is a good start, and they start out well. Um, along the way, they begin to adjust the blue maize potty into male and female, very similar to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 21, where the body that contains the whole of the soul, male and female, is separated, and you now have a feminine and a masculine body. The same happens here. At first, this was very good, because in this dimension of duality, um, it's a lonely place. You're isolated in one manifested form, whereas in the heavens you, all, you feel the oneness of all the souls together and the creative forces one with you. Here you're kind of isolated. It's lonesome. Genesis comes right out and says, the Lord said, they're lonesome here. Um, so this works very well for a while, and then what happens? The people start getting back into their human nature, their self-gratification, and uh, the Mayan story says the perfect blue maize people's eyes were chipped a little bit, and they didn't see as clearly as they used to. And they started getting into the cloud of selfishness, self-pursuit, losing the harmony and the oneness with the whole. And that age ends with fiery rain. Um, it is believed that this is the age of the destruction. The whole period is the age of Atlantis. And it is the end of this period is the end of Atlantis and Lemuria. All the ancient uh, prehistoric realms are destroyed. Uh, Genesis 6 where God says, I'm going to start over. We're going to clean all this up and begin again. This period is the end of the old era. All those lands are destroyed, volcanoes, uh, meteors, uh, the Carolina Bays is one of the features that may have had a lot to do with the naming of this as fiery rain. You recall that this uh, comet meteorite came across North America from the upper Pacific Northwest all the way across and broke into countless fiery pieces, crashed into the Carolinas all the way down making the Puerto Rican trench, that deep trench under the sea. All this was so profound, it, it was explosive and destroyed the whole area with fiery rain, earthquakes, and volcanoes. The old age ends, and now we start anew. Here again you see the warning once again, please 
grab a hold of your heart. Hold your heart, con control it, center yourself, temper your lust for everything and selfishness and self-pursuit. Come back into an awareness of harmony with the whole. And this starts the fourth age in which we really start to get into real physicality and bodies like we're familiar with. It's called Eagles to Turkeys. The great eagles of God can now only fly a little ways. They really have descended into matter. From celestial awareness and um, freedom to terrestrial containment and material existence. And we enter the age of the simians, the monkey bodies. That's the story the Mayan Aztec legend tells us. This is the first physical Eden. And now we're moving into real earth bodies, real physical material bodies of a simian quality. It's a sad age. It runs from about 50,000 BC uh, through this cycle that you and I uh, know of as history uh, to August 13th, 3,114 BC. It's amazing how exact they are. Archaeologists tell us the greatest calendar makers on the planet were the Mayans. They used the sun, the moon, and Venus to measure time. They were precise. And the end of that fourth age was August 13th, 3114 BC. But thank goodness it began the fifth age of this great circle with the sun god with us. This is the legend that God decided they are lost, I'm going down with them. And God comes into this realm with us. The sun god joins us. In this process, it goes on until December 21st, 22nd, the winter solstice of 2012. And this age is called the age of movement, of change, of ascension. Uh, we are going to go through the journey of selfishness to a point where we say this can't be all there is to life and my existence. And that starts the change. And that whole period is symbolized by this circle in the middle. And it brings us to uh, the modern times that we've been living in. Now, of course, people have looked at this and said, well, that's the end of the world. There are only five ages depicted here. They haven't noticed the two pyramids. The red one inside the striped yellow and red one on the top here. These secretly are the final two ages. And they're much shorter than these long periods. Noticed how this age here was about two million years old. And this one here um, was about uh, 200,000 years long. And this one here was a brief 50,000 year period. They're shortening as we come back in it. And what was the age of movement? About a little over 5,000 years. Well, the next two ages are quite short too, but they always point upward. The movement now is like these pyramids pointing upward. In order to discover the next two ages and what those two pyramids meant, I had to pursue the research into uh, groups that actually had left Mesoamerica. According to ancient legends, the people holding the light or the truth left when they saw the spiritual decline um, in this area of Central America, Mesoamerica. The decline was symbolized by human sacrifice, the beginning of the confusion of the ancient legend. Quetzalcoatl Kuku Khan, Guku Maz had said, put your hearts into the fire. And now they were so uh, distorted in their wisdom and understanding that they were taking physical hearts out of bodies. They had lost the truth, the, the meaning, the deeper truth of the ancient story. And those who had the light escaped and took it with them. Some went up the Mississippi Valley and became the mound builders. Others went up Chaco Canyon, became the cave dwellers, and moved further on. I found these next ages in some of the uh, ancient legends of the Navajo. 
And the two ages that follow the five ages here and are symbolized by the pyramid within a pyramid is the sixth age called the spirit of living things. This age we're moving in, this age that we've begun, is an age of awareness of the true life essence, the true celestial essence of beings, of things, of forces, not so much the terrestrial, the physical, the three-dimensional, but opening to the fourth and fifth dimensional aspects, the pure inner energies and um, life qualities of these things, the spirit of all living things. And um, the age is um, not supposed to be as long as the age you and I have gone through, which is a little over 5,000 years. We don't exactly know how long. I wasn't able to find that anywhere. Then that age is followed by the seventh age. And there are only seven ages. Many ancient mystical teachings identify the seven ages of man, including the Edgar Cayce readings, who said the Egyptians identified it. Later you're going to see that in the Egyptian prophecy. There are only seven ages. I know we think we're evolving here forever materially, but really before the great evolution there was an involution into matter. We're only temporarily sojourning here. We're going to move on. It's a strange idea, isn't it? That at some point humanity will leave the three-dimensional planet we've come to know so well. But according to them, the seventh age is the place of melting into one, of moving back into the oneness in a celestial, a higher mental consciousness moving away from projected life into the inner oneness of all life and a celestial movement into the expanse of the entire universe, our universal consciousness occurring. That's the seventh age, the final movement. It doesn't mean that you can't have that while you're physically here. You'll see that later when we look at the biblical prophecies and all. This can occur while still incarnating in the earth. It's a, it's a strange little detail, but you will not desire to maintain yourself in the earth because you'll be celestial, but you could manifest three-dimensionally if you'd like. We'll see more of that later. So, the key thing to come away with from the pre-Mayan, Mayan, Aztec, Toltec prophecies and wisdom is that it's about celestial godlings made in the image of the Creator out on an adventure who um, move into the realm of three dimensions and materialism and selfishness, self-awareness and the runaway desires of the senses and of self-pursuit that leads them into a ball game with the lords of darkness and they wrestle in the game and the lords of darkness have fooled the children of the light into thinking that the loser of the game suffers death when there really is no death for an immortal being but if you think it is then it is until you awaken to who you really are and the immortality of your celestial spiritual nature this is all wrapped up in the um, prophecy, the philosophy, the perspective of the ancient ones looking from our descent to our ascent, from the two great serpents coming down of mind and energy into lower dimensions and ascending back up into the higher dimensions. So the Mayan Aztec prophecy is a positive prophecy. Yes, there's struggles. Yes, there's a ball game of great uh, danger and thrill and uh, potential uh, confusion and death, but eventually we will awaken with the help of God who's running through the game with us, who's with us in the whole process, and there will be an awakening and a resurrection out of this period. Only seven ages. We, are, we have wrapped up the fifth age here with the 2012 
We're moving into the sixth and eventually into the seventh.